Hi, everybody, and welcome. It's Friday, so it must be Kinetics USA weekly show, Onwards and Upwards. Everything that a nurse or a healthcare worker needs to know about coming to live and work in the United States. My name is Tanya Friedman. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Kinetics USA, and I have with me Anshu. Hi, Anshu. Welcome. Hi, everybody. And also Mike. Hi, Mike. Welcome. Hi, hey guys. Um, and today's topic is our legal panel's question and answer session. So this is the time, everybody. If you are a nurse sitting anywhere in the world and you have a legal question you have in front of you, the best legal minds in the country, and they look at Mike's face, <laughs> and they will be able to help you with any of your burning questions and answers about the immigration process about coming to the United States. So if you are watching right now, please put into the chat what your name is and where you're watching from. We love to see everybody from all over the world. And I literally have reams and reams of paper in front of me of questions that nurses have sent through over the last few, um, few days. Uh, to ask the legal experts, and um, we're going to get right to it now and, and start asking the questions. If you have a question for Mike or for Anshu, please put it into the chat, and I will try and get through as many questions as we can in the next hour. Um, so I see we have Leo watching, Brenz is watching from Philippines. Please, if you're watching today, put into the chat any questions you might have and where you are watching from in, uh, around the world. So before we get started, Mike and Anshu, if you want to maybe give like a 30 second introduction about your background, let's start with Anshu. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is Anshu Anand. Uh, I am an immigration attorney. Uh, I've been practicing for about 10 years now. Um, my practice is primarily in business-based immigration. I work a lot in the healthcare and IT sectors. Um, and our firm is based out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Thank you, Andrew. Mike, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Mike Hammond. Um, I'm uh, been practicing for a little bit longer than Andrew, but not much longer, just a tiny <laughs> bit. Uh, and I am um, uh, also do a lot of healthcare. Uh, work and we're also based in Cincinnati. Anshu and I are about uh, five blocks away from each yes. other. So. Okay, so you can wave through the window right now. Well, we can. We're on different sides of the buildings from each other. Ah, so we okay. couldn't really see each other, but we we could get close. Okay, so you can wave through the Zoom, the, the, the StreamYard screen That's right. right now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so let's get started, everybody. And um, as I said, if you are just joining us now, please put into the chat what your name is and where you're watching. We'd love to see everybody watching from around the world. And please put in your question and answers, uh, sorry, your questions for the expert immigration panel. I'll try to get through as many questions as I can. Um, okay, so first question for the panel is a question from Claire. Claire is asking, if an aged out dependent of an EB3 is issued an immigrant visa, is it a guarantee that he will be granted the green card once he or she flies to the United States? So Anshu, I think um, that question is obviously somebody who um, didn't think their dependent was gonna get through and, and uh, got a visa. What is your opinion on that one? Well, I mean, if they've already received the visa from the U.S. Embassy, then obviously the consulate officer has already gone through the process of ensuring that the individual, you know, didn't have an age out issue. Um, and so in my opinion, you know, as long as the, as long as the age out child uh, travels within that 180 days and comes into the U.S., I don't anticipate an issue in getting the actual green card once they arrive. Okay. Do you ever see that happen? Mike, and feel free to join in, where some a child you weren't sure was going to get the visa and they got it. Have you seen that happen? Uh, sure. I, first of all, there's something called the Child Status Protection Act that is designed. It's you're 21, not necessarily when you're 21. Uh, you're 21 plus uh, the number of days that the immigrant petition has been pending. Um, there are circumstances, too, that the often the consulate or the USCIS office will take into account a your age is locked in. 
and even though that may or may not really be a legal concept, that's kind of how they approach it. If you've had a prior petition, um, we've seen a situation where it appears to us that the only thing the consulate could have done is added the dates up of both of your I-140s pending, even though that's not legally really relevant in the CSPA formula, but we've certainly seen it. I personally think the consulates do what they can within the parameters of the law to try to protect aging out children that are close. And yeah. we've seen some that if I were say auditing their files, I'm not positive I could come up with a good legal reason why they chose to do it. But um, they, this could be an area where they have some discretion. So we certainly have seen that, but I agree with you, with Andrew, that if you got it issued by the consulate, they're not going to question as long as you enter within your time frame. Okay, good. Okay, so Claire, you can relax, you can rejoice because it looks like um, your child is coming with you to the United States. Um, Maurice has a question. I have waited for a year for an I-140 adjudication, but got an I an RFE. So for everybody uh, listening, it, it sounds like Maurice had an I-140 that didn't have premium processing. Um, and Maurice's question, what should I do next? What document from the nurse does the USCIS usually need? Mike? Well, it depends on what the RFE asks for. Uh, the RFE could be something that's directed at you, the nurse, or it could be something that's directed at the petitioner, the employer that's sponsoring you, or it could be a combination thereof. So if it's a, a, a common we might, uh, one we might see for uh, asking questions of the nurse uh, would be for better experience letters, more complete experience letters if experience is required in that case. Um, sometimes they'll have questions about maybe you only have, you don't have the official NCLEX past letter, maybe you simply got a letter from one of the state boards uh, who you tested through saying that you've passed. So maybe they'll want the NCSBN letter. Um, those are probably the most common ones we see relative to the, on the nurse side, but essentially the attorney that's handling your case for your petitioner will reach out to you if they need something and say, here's the three things we need or whatever. From the petitioner, it could be a whole variety of things. It could be asking for corporate documentation. It could be asking about the posting. It could be asking about, do you really need RNs? There can be a, a whole series of some, some of which are really simple to answer, some of which frankly are much more complicated uh, to answer. Um, so, and the timing of an RV uh, right now, uh, there's a end date, which I believe is 84 days or something. And shoot, does that sound right? 80, yeah, 87. Like that. Mm -hmm. 87. But there's also a uh, extra 60 days for COVID um, that's been in effect for God, two years now uh, and is still in effect. Um, so there is a deadline for RFEs. Um, and oftentimes companies, it even appears your case was not filed as premium to start with. Often companies, if there is an RFE and they think they can get a quick uh, positive answer, will upgrade it to premium as part of that RFE response. So that's something you may want to uh, request. And then the RFE response takes on the premium rules, which is 15 business days. So essentially two to three weeks. Okay, so that's really good advice, um, Mike. And Maurice, uh, it might be a good idea to speak to your petitioner and see if they would uh, want to do premium processing for you to be able to get your answer quicker. And you, for those people who are um, not as familiar with the process, can you maybe just explain a little bit about premium processing, how that works, and um, just elaborate on if you get an RFE, how uh, premium processing might assist? Sure. So premium processing is exactly what it, what it says. It, it's a way to expedite your case um, uh, at the I-140 stage. And so it's really at the discretion of the employer, the petitioner, if they want to premium your case, because there is additional there are additional fees that are involved. Um, and so uh, it, once the case is filed and if it is filed premium processing, uh, you can anticipate a response, uh, whether it's an approval or an RFE, like Mike mentioned, uh, within 15, uh, 15 days from the government. Um, and uh, 
And so uh, if an RFP is issued, then, uh, you know, you would have to get the documentation um, together. Your employer would have to get the documentation together with your attorney. They would respond. And what would happen then is that the 15 day clock would actually have to restart. And so, as you know, just like Mike mentioned. And so, um, you know, just I always want to kind of reiterate that because I think a lot of times, um, you know, candidates think that as soon as the RFE response is filed, that they should have a response within a day or two. But the reality is, is the clock re resets itself. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. And just for everybody to know, if you are sponsored through a Kinetics USA employer, um, all the employers these days do premium processing, pay premium processing. So if you do get an RFE, don't panic because um, hopefully we'll get it resolved quickly. As Mike has also mentioned, sometimes it can be very simple, the RFEs. I know often nurses just, you know, when they get an RFE, it's like, a oh my God, this means I'm not going to go to America ever. And I'm you know, kind of like a, in a tailspin, it, it's it's often something that's easily resolved. So please um, don't panic and um, speak to your your um, your agency and your uh, uh, your lawyer about that. Okay, I'm going to take some questions from the chat. So I see Leo saying hi. Brenz is from the Philippines. Patricia from the Philippines. GB from the Philippines. Maxi has a question. I read about USCIS processing updates. Want to verify if I have an I-140 premium processing is now two weeks. I am an RM from Ghana. So Maxi, I think we just answered your question. <laughs> um, so uh, good news on that. Co Kofela, I hope I've got that right, is watching from South Africa, my home country. Kofela, so welcome. Alubi from Nigeria, Nash um, is saying hi. Um, Max is asking, what are the documents required for the nurse aid program? And Shu, can you talk a little bit about nurse aids? Sure. So um, nursing aides are, they they go through a, a similar green card path as, uh, as you know, uh, registered nurses. The only thing I would say is, you know, for the registered nurses, there's usually a two-step process, right? It's the filing of the I-140 and then going to the consulate for your interview. Nursing aides, in fact, they have an additional timeline that's attached to them because they have to go through the labor certification process. Um, so if we're saying that a nurse takes about 12 months to come here, uh, add an additional nine months to a nursing aid application. Now, with regards to what documentation you need to prove um, for the nursing aid, um, it just really depends upon your petitioner and what their requirements are. And so, um, you know, I know there are some nursing aid uh, uh, positions out there that require like six months of experience in a healthcare setting. Um, there's also other nursing aid positions out there that don't require any experience and just maybe a high school diploma. So it's going to depend on the employer. Um, one, uh, and then just, you know, again, keep in mind that timeline is a little bit lengthier than a, a typical uh, Schedule A case. Okay, thank you, Anshu. Um, and if anybody is interested in an RN position or a nurse aide position or a med tech position, any of the allied healthcare worker positions, please apply to the Kinetics USA website and our team on our, are on hand right now to help you with any positions that you might have. We literally have thousands of positions all over the United States right now, all direct hire, um, which um, is very exciting. And there's enormous demand for nurses right now as healthcare and healthcare workers, uh, nurse aides, allied positions as well. So please go ahead and apply online. Oh, and before I forget, please everybody stay on until the end of the show because we will be announcing the NCLEX winner of our scholarship. So please stay on to see at the end of the show if your name is drawn. Kinetics USA have our NCLEX scholarship. It's our way of paying it forward for nurses where we pay for nurses to do the NCLEX course um, and uh, and and also the the application process um, and um, we're very excited today because we have a raffle where we will be announcing the winner of the person who will we will be paying for their exam costs as well so if you're in the NCLEX scholarship or interested in the scholarship please stay on until the end of the show um okay Jimmy Jimmy SA is watching from Riyadh um, Rossell is asking, can I transfer my case to a different embassy while my dependent is on the current embassy? Mike? Yeah, it, it depends upon your um, relationship to the country and the embassy you're looking to transfer to. So if you are working in a country and have a 
a uh, relationship with that country, then you can transfer uh, to that embassy. And the uh, embassy transfers are basically up to the discretion of the embassy there. So if you've got a long-term visa and you're working there for two years, you're gonna have no trouble getting that embassy to transfer you. Obviously your spouse cannot be processed until after your process though. So I would, in a situation like this, where generally you and your spouse are gonna get approved together, in a situation like this, that would not happen, you would be approved first. And then I would frankly expect a pretty significant delay for your spouse, because I think the communication to the embassy where your spouse is at saying, hey, now, now you've been approved will not be seamless um, and will not be quick. It could be, but I would certainly guess that it will not be. So normally we try to keep families together as much as possible, but sometimes it's impossible to do. You're on a work assignment in Australia for two years or Singapore and your spouse doesn't have authority to enter there or whatever. Um, so it does happen, but it in most cases creates delays. So so typically prefer not to do that where, where possible, right, Mike? Yeah, yes. Yeah. But in today's climate, because for example, the Philippines is so backed up, there's a lot of people who are extending assignments at different places across the world. And so you're gonna get your embassy done, but maybe your spouse has no way to get there. And, you know, it kind of creates almost like a follow to join scenario where you're coming to the US first and gonna work. And then your spouse is gonna come later because that's likely gonna be the practical effect. Okay. All right, so there you go, Rasel. Jennifer saying another great show. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Rain is asking, hello, Kinetics family. What are the factors why it really takes time for my case to be transferred from USCIS to NBC? And this is a question that we get often. Many nurses, you know, feel very uh, frustrated and impatient with the process. When they get an I-140, it's like, oh yes, I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm on track. And then there's a delay waiting for the NBC. Can you talk a little bit about the timing there? Um, sure. So normally uh, when an I-140 is approved, uh, it takes approximately about 45 to 60 days for the um, for the case to get transferred to the NBC. Um, and I've actually I've been seeing that. I think part of the issue really with the timing element and the delay is that, uh, you know, not all offices are really working at full capacity. And so I think we just have to be patient to understand that, like, things are starting to get back on track. Um, but that, you know, even the NBC, you know, I don't think that they're working at full capacity yet, you know, so that's probably one of mainly the reason that you're seeing that delay. But I, I am seeing cases transferred within 60 days. Yeah, I would agree with you, Andrew. Mike, I don't know what your experience has been. Um, typically, you would look at that kind of time frame. And then during the pandemic, we did see some delays, but it, it seems to be edging to the more positive side again. Mike, what is your experience? No, I would agree. I, I think, and I think that there are always exceptions. There are files that get lost, but most cases move along that normal processing guide. Good. Okay. Oh, and I see Nash has the same question. So there we go, Nash, we've just answered your question. Um, and keep the questions coming, everybody. I'm going to try and get through as many as possible um, in the next, what are we, like 45 minutes or so. So um, I know that there are, this process is very frustrating, is very long. It can feel very overwhelming. You're not sure where to start, where to go. Um, and I really encourage everybody to put your questions into the chat and also go to go to the Kinetics USA website. Um, on the Kinetics USA website, you will find our, find our success path. The success path is really a great way for you to kind of understand the process. Um, when you're coming as a registered nurse, what are the steps that you need to get to from the beginning when you pass the NCLEX to number seven, which is where you enjoy and prosper and you've arrived in the United States. And you'll see number three right there is the visa, the, the visa framework, which is what we're talking about right now. So it kind of gives you a great roadmap of how, how things fit together. Brains is asking, any update about the backlog in the U.S. Embassy Manila um, after documentary complete? how long it will take to get an interview date, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> um, Manila is, is one of those, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I you know, again, I, I always wanna say, I know we're specifically talking about Manila, 
but it really is dependent upon the embassy. But with Manila, I, I mean, I'm seeing, uh, you know, still cases from 2020 that are, uh, you know, that are being scheduled interviews. Um, so, uh, you know, I think if you're, if you're within a five to 12 month timeline, uh, it's, that's normal. I think if your case has been pending for over a year, I think that's where I would encourage you to like get in contact with your employer um, and your, uh, you know, your um, uh, recruiter, just to kind of, uh, you know, so that they can maybe put in a request to see exactly what it is that's going on. But, you know, I, what we do know is that, you know, the Department of State is uh, trying to make uh, the backlog in Manila, Manila a little bit less. They are working on it. You know, in fact, the White House has tried. Uh, they've actually said that, you know, they want to make health care um, recruitment, uh, you know, a priority, and they are trying to work on that backlog. And, you know, there's definitely different organizations that are working behind the scenes, like the AIHR, which a lot of us are, actually, I think all of us are members of. And, um, you know, and I think they're working behind the scenes with the Department of State specifically about Manila. So I know that that's being, you know, kind of really targeted right now. So just kind of keep hope, everybody. You know, I do think the numbers are better uh, from quarter four. So quarter one of 2022, I think are much better than quarter four of 2021. So I think that alone should just give everybody some hope that things are moving along. Yeah, I agree 100%. That's a some very similar trend to what we're seeing right now. Mike, is that what you're seeing as well with the delays at the consulates? Uh, yes, no question about it. But there is still a major backlog there. And it just will take time for them to get through it. But we certainly saw major improvement in um, first quarter of, uh, of this year. As I understand it, the uh, a undersecretary, uh, so a fairly high level position from the Department of State is either down in Manila now or on their way to Manila to observe and try to work on the backlog. And my suggestion was they should man a window for a while and that would help. But uh, I assume they're gonna just typical government they'll review and go oh the line's really long let's see what we can do yeah but I don't know. well well good that that action is happening and absolutely and, and certainly uh, better news than it was six months ago oh a hundred percent we are yeah. seeing way more cases coming through so definitely the trend mo is moving in a positive direction so that's encouraging and as Andrew said um, you know, the thing just to mention from a Kinetics USA perspective um, is, yes, obviously, we, we want our nurses to be expediting their cases, but also we want, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of intervention, as Andrew said, from the AAIA. AAIHR perspective, um, and we are all members of that. Kinetics, uh, Mike and, and Andrew's firm are all members of the, that organization. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, good input that's come from that. We also have many of our employers right now working through their local congressmen, and we're seeing excellent results in that regard as well. So that has really been very helpful. So if you're, you, um, you know, it, it is frustrating, we know that, um, it can feel very hopeless and uh, and just you know very upsetting. But know that there's a lot of action being taken right now to get cases expedited and move uh, get over this backlog that was caused by the pandemic. Uh, okay, Jinu has a question. Um, oh, this is a question that comes up every every month. What about Indian nurses, those who have the NCLEX, Mike? Um. Well, the easy answer is sad, but uh, true. I don't think there's any opportunities. I think the retrogression, the line for India is so long that it would need a legislative change um, in order for there to be any realistic option at a new petition. Okay, so uh, hopefully, um, Jinu, there will be some legislation change. Um, and um, and then Indian nurses can come through to the United States. But if you are an Indian nurse and you have a previous priority date, um, please apply to Kinetics USA and our team will be happy to help you. Andrew, do you want to explain to everybody what a previous priority date means? Sure. So if you had a previous employer that um, filed an I-140 immigrant petition for you, um, 
it, you know, that uh, once the I-140 is filed and the case is approved, you're given what's called a, a priority date. And the priority date's important because, you know, the Department of State has a quota on the number of green cards they issue. And so every month, um, you know, that that visa bulletin kind of moves back or they move forward. And that priority date is important because that actually puts you in queue and lets you know where you are in terms of, uh, you know, becoming current and if an immigrant visa is available to you. Um, and then I just would like to add a, one more thing about the Indian nurses. So, you know, one thing that I also um, see is just the idea of cross chargeability. If you uh, if you maybe are married to, uh, you know, someone I always say like France, um, you can always, you know, tack your prior your um, uh, country of you can tack their country of birth to your application. And so sometimes instead of having to wait that 10, 12 year wait, you if all the all other category is current, then you know you then you also become current, and the, therefore an immigrant visa is available for you, and then you kind of move a little bit quicker through the process. Okay, thank you for mentioning cross, cross chargeability, Anshu. So that is definitely an option if you are married to somebody who was born in another country other than India or China. Um, okay, I have so many questions here. I don't know which one to ask first. Um, oh, Honda's asking similar question. Um, I'm an Indian-born RN with a bachelor's degree, Canadian citizen. Can I get the TN visa? Matt, Mike? Uh, yes, you're a Canadian citizen. It doesn't matter where you're born. You can get a TN. However, when a when you're being sponsored for a green card, you're still going to be in the Indian line. So even though you're a Canadian citizen, you remain charged to country of birth. So a lot of uh, nurses uh, from India who are Canadian citizens are choosing to go the TN route, but are not necessarily viewing it as a green card um, option. But uh, yes, TN, and there's no problem. It's your, it's, it's e e easy to obtain a TN. Okay, so there you go, Honda. Um, one thing to bear in mind is we have a question here from Maria, who's asking, I'm coming on a TN visa, can my spouse work, aren't you? Um, the spouse would actually have to apply for an employment authorization document to be able to work. Um, so it's not like so like for a TN visa, once they come into the US, they have automatic the automatic ability to work. Whereas with the TD, which is the dependent visa, they would have to apply for authorization. Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, and and if you if you if your spouse is looking to uh, to work in the United States, then I would suggest you you check out the list of occupations that qualifies for the TN visa, um, because for example, if your spouse is an engineer, um, they might be able to qualify to get their own TN visa. Um, Mar and Patrick um, are asking about the timeline, so we've covered that question. Eileen is watching from. Um, uh, Saudi, Haru, Haruna is watching from Ghana, Eldrin from Fort Myers. Um, Mark is also asking about the timeline, so we've answered that question. Christian is asking how to become a scholar in the um, nurse aid, oh, in the, in the kinetics nurse scholarship. So Christian, um, that's a great question. Um, all nurses are qualified to enter the scholarship. Um, please go to Kinetics USA website and apply and if you have not yet passed the NFLEX our team will evaluate your background and see if you might be eligible to apply for the kinetic scholarship and we're going to be there's new some exciting news coming out on the scholarship we're actually going to be broadening and um, the scholarship as well in the coming weeks and months so stay tuned for that but anybody who's interested please apply and we'd love you to join the scholarship we're getting great results many many people passing and um, and be able to be sponsored for schedule a green cards so please go ahead and apply christian um uh okay i'm just seeing if there's any questions here that we haven't asked um reke is asking it's mentioned about certified copy of birth certificate for embassy interview my certificate is printed from the website of the state is it considered an original if no who is eligible to certify it as a true copy, Mike? Uh, what country are you from? Can we get an? Um, oh, so I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, it's hard to tell. 
Um, so the way the rules work about what's uh, acceptable for a birth certificate or a marriage certificate or anything else depends upon the country. And so there's a whole big long catalog, a list it's called the Foreign Affairs Manual that basically says, if you are from this country, this is what you need. And so we need a little more information to determine um, what, that what you have is sufficient. But the attorney you're working with will be able to do that uh, pretty easily. And keep in mind the consulates in the country where you're getting visas are very familiar with the circumstances and documents of documents and birth certificates and records from that particular country. That's where they work. They are very well tuned into that. And so if, if that would be considered a certified original copy, then it is. The fact that it's a copy isn't necessarily uh, uh, problematic, but it does vary uh, by country. Okay, thank it you, Mike. very helpful, was it? Sorry. Thank you, Mike. Um, Jink is watching from the UAE. Brenz is Angelo. Watch this video. Oh, there we go. Brenz is paying it forward and, and um, telling a friend or colleague to watch this video. Please, everybody, tag your friends and colleagues. This video, uh, this uh, live every week is our way of paying it forward for nurses. Um, just trying to serve you and help you. Um, so please tag your friends and colleagues and get them to watch as well so that they can be informed on the immigration questions that are on everybody's mind. Um, Jason is asking, we get this question every month, and shoot any predictions about retrogression in 2022? Um, in 2022, um, no, not really. You know, I think if you look at the visa bulletin right now, um, it, you know, it's still favorable for um, the Philippines and the worldwide EB3. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really move forward for China EB2, China EB3, or India EB3. Um, you know, one thing we did notice uh, was that there was language at the end of the visa bulletin that kind of hinted at possible, you know, maybe retrogression. But, you know, just in our in, in analysis, we think that the Department of State likely place that language there because there are so many green cards that are being issued right now. And so um, I think what we anticipate is that there's just going to be a slowdown in the summer months um, just so that, uh, you know, we can continue uh, until the new fiscal year so that there is no retrogression. Okay. Well, hopefully no retrogression is what we're going to get. Um, Anna is asking, um, how much is the lawyer's fee for nurses and dependents? So, Anna, just to answer that question, um, typically, um, you know, in the Kinetics USA model, the employer will pay for your petition and for the lawyer's fees, and you would be eligible to, or, or eligible would be required to pay for the uh, dependents fee. Um, and I think you might be referring to the fee bill, which is $345 per person. Um, Okay, um, Marine is asking, I would like to know regarding my petition that has been filed as a main applicant and my spouse as a dependent back in 2018. My husband filed for his petition on employment and kept me as a dependent, but still we didn't get any response after consultative uh, the consulate interview in July 2021. So I'd like to make sure that it doesn't affect my case. So it seems like in this case, and her husband had a petition which for some reason didn't go through and, and now has a new case. Mike, do you think that's going to affect Marine's new case? Uh, potentially, uh, because the circumstances of any prior immigration filing are going to be taken into consideration in any new subsequent filing. So depending upon why your case from 2018 did not move forward would impact your new case in 2021. Now, if the case in 2018 didn't move forward, simply because maybe the position ended, the sponsor pulled the, you know, the uh, sponsorship opportunity or something like that, then it'll have no effect. But if there was something that came up during the interview that may be problematic, uh, then uh, certainly they will take a look at the 2018 case. Okay, and even if it was her husband's case, not her case, all right, there you go, Maureen. Um, Jeff is watching from Georgia. Hi, Jeff. We're so excited that you're here. Um, Jeff is a very avid watcher of the show. Um, okay. Wow, so many questions. I am like looking. Okay, we've got a question from Nomida. Um, Nomida um, 
uh, arrived in the United States on January 9th, but the officer did not take her visa packet. Um, and now it seems that her green card is delayed. Anshu, what should Normita do in that case? Um, well, I think I, I, there's two options. One, uh, she can either go back to the port of entry that she came through and maybe try to talk to an officer there, um, or uh, maybe even go to deferred inspection um, which, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like an office that when you have problems coming into the U S they sometimes can help clear up these kinds of issues. Um, so I would recommend either one of those, either going back to the, uh, the port of entry that she came through and trying to talk to someone there or deferred inspection. Okay. Thank you for that. So just, a, uh, one, um, word of advice, Mike, if, if somebody comes through, the border and the the officer doesn't ask for their visa but their, their visa packet because some i mean it does sometimes happen what should they do they should politely and kindly <laughs> and very patiently offer the visa package okay to the officer in a very kind way not in a hey you forgot to ask me of this okay so. got it um <laughs> okay um we have um, a question uh, from Jacob. Jacob is asking, what happens when in the immigration mark proce process my passport gets expired, Anshu? Um, during the process? During the, uh, well, I think the main thing is just uh, you need to go ahead and make sure you put in place the, like a renewal of your passport. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think like if you were, let's say if you were to get to the embassy interview, because I'm not sure where in the immigration process he's referring to, because um, if it was at the I-140 stage, you know, I, I would be okay with, you know, just filing the case and then indicating that a that a um, renewal was in in process. But like if you're at the embassy stage, you would just want to show that like, hey, I've applied for a renewal of my passport. I'm just waiting for it. You know, take that documentation showing that you put in the renewal. And what may happen is that, you know, the officer will not issue your visa. Then they'll issue the visa once they get your new passport. So um, so the main thing is just go ahead, no matter where you are in the immigration process, you need to go ahead and get that renewal started. Okay, so, um, and, and good advice, just best practice is that if you are a healthcare worker looking to come to the United States, make sure that your passport is valid and then it's not gonna expire anytime soon. So that's just, you know, best practice, good advice. Um, Mike, we have a question here from Nurse One. Nurse One um, is, is, has a question about buying out a contract. So um, sometimes um, uh, uh, the question is, um, is it, um, can it affect my citizenship if I come to the United States on a green card with an employer and after a few months buy out that contract and go work for another employer? Uh, theoretically, it can. Uh, the USCIS, as part of a naturalization interview, is going to look at your history of immigration. How you arrived, did you work for that company? The key is and that you need to have an intent. When you're coming into the US, your intent is to work for that employer that sponsored you. And the employer has to have the intent of actually employing you in that particular role. So if you leave after only a month or two and pay out a buyout, it certainly appears that maybe you didn't really have the intent to work there. That maybe you simply were using this employer as a way to immigrate to the U.S. with the intent to simply pay some cash so that you got out of that commitment. Uh, now, there are other circumstances that could have changed. Maybe the employer didn't place you in the role that they said they're gonna place you in. Maybe they're working you as a nurse's aide and not an RN. Maybe they put you in Buffalo, New York, when instead they said you're going to be in sunny Fort Myers, Florida. That would be back to that would defend your position of, hey, I left. I intended, but they, you know, kind of breached the contract. Uh, but it is certainly something that you want to keep in mind, um, uh, especially in the first few months. I would say after six months, it's probably not an issue at all. Uh, but in the first several months, I would say that is at least a potential for issue. Yeah, um, I, I, I think that is something very important that nurses need to bear in mind. And what I we, what we always say at Kinetics is when you enter a contract and um, a commitment with an employer, you have to think of that as a marriage. 
it's a commitment. They're spending a lot of money. They're waiting for you. Um, it's a big investment on the healthcare facility side, and you need to show that same commitment. So don't sign anything if you're not sure that that's what you want. Um, it's, you know, there are many employers that are sponsoring right now, and it's really important, um, I think, for all healthcare workers to take that commitment very, very seriously. As Mike said, it can affect your citizenship when you come to, uh, to apply for citizenship after five years in the United States. Um, okay, um, we have a question here uh, from Christina. Christina is asking, do you provide H-1 visas for nurses through CAP exempt? Anshu? Um, H-1B visas through CAP exempt. No, no I, I haven't ever actually worked on H-1B visas through CAP exempt. I'm not sure if Mike wants to add to that. I haven't ever. I don't think that they're eligible for the H-1B. Mike? Uh, yeah, for, for most RNs, they don't call you don't qualify for an H-1B, whether it's a cap exempt employer, whether it's not. In order to get an H-1B, you have to prove that not only do you have a BSN in this situation, which is probably easy, but you have to prove that the job that you're filling also requires a bachelor's degree. And the standard in the US in every state is simply an associate's degree to get a license. The standard in the vast majority of hospitals, there's only a handful of hospitals that require a BSN for employment as an RN. There are some positions, so like some nurse educator type positions uh, that would qualify for a bachelor's degree. Generally, those have master's degrees even though, but I would agree that generally speaking, an H-1B is simply not an option for a nurse. So the issue of finding a cap exempt employer is kind of a moot point. They don't have any special rules for H-1Bs for RNs. They simply avoid the lottery. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Mike, for clearing that up. Um, no Peach is asking, is the IELTS easier than the TOEFL? Um, not really specifically an immigration question, so I can maybe answer that. Um, I'm not sure if the, the IELTS is easier than the TOEFL. I think they're both quite difficult exams. We do tend to see that most nurses these days take the IELTS exam um, for various reasons. Um, and uh, one thing just to mention is that Kinetics USA have an IELTS scholarship. So any nurse that is, pla that is placed through, through Kinetics at a, at a Kinetics employer, um, Kinetics pay for an IELTS course. Um, so, you know, we know that most nurses are more uh, worried about the IELTS than the NCLEX exam. It's more stressful and, and um, causes a lot of anxiety. So the good news is that we do have an IELTS course. We have had enormous success with that course. I would encourage anybody to look at our social media, at our website, at our YouTube channel, our social media, look at some of the IELTS hero interviews. Um, I always quote Bert, he's one of the Kinetics nurses. Um, he failed the IELTS seven times. He then came to Kinetics, he did the IELTS course that we provide free of charge for all Kinetics nurses, and he passed with an eight in speaking and a seven overall, higher score than is even required. So um, for anybody who's worried about the IELTS, please check that out, because I think you'll find it very encouraging and inspiring. Um, okay, uh, David is asking, um, asking for a friend, does the US Department of Labor do anything to fast track the prevailing wage determination Perm Schedule A process backlog, and you? Oh, that's unfortunately. I, no. <laughs> I think that's a wish on every everyone's uh, wish list. Um, unfortunately, right now the prevailing wage determinations are taking about six months. Um, so there is unfortunately no way to fast track that. There's also no, um, you know, there is just no way to, to be able to fast track that or expedite it in any way. Yeah. And that's where from our side, we used to have nurses interview with employers before the prevailing wage came back before it was, you know, it, it was like two months or three months. But now from our side, we don't actually do that. When our nurses interview, the prevailing wage is already back from the Department of Labor. As Andrew said, unfortunately, there's no way at this time to expedite that piece of the process. Uh, Brian has a question. If applying from Canada, is there an advantage of applying for TN visa first, then applying for EB3, or is it better to just apply for the EB3 directly? There's a good question we get often, um, Mike. Yeah, I, I think it's, there's two different uh, 
perspectives to this. From a, an employer's perspective, they would prefer for you to do a TN because you can, you know, come in and work next weekend, uh, kind of a thing. And possibly for your family, that may not be the best route. Maybe you have a spouse who de desperately wants to work and they're not going to be able to work on a TD. Maybe they don't, don't qualify for any of the uh, other work visa options. And so you may say, we don't want to be in the U.S. with my spouse being unable to work. And so there you're going to need an employer who is going to want to uh, file for your EB-3. So I think this is a part of it is a uh, circumstances on your part. Also, you have to keep in mind how long you're going to wait in line for EB-3. Uh, if you are from China or India, you're still going to wait in line. And that may not be an option at all. An employer may only be interested in you if you're going to do a TN. Or if you're from some other country where it's not so long, uh, maybe they'll wait for you. Uh, kind of a situation. But I, there's also situations where you may choose to do the TN, also file for the EB-3 at the same time. Maybe your family stays in Canada for a while, then they come in. There's a variety of ways it could be done, uh, but it is going to be very much a personal decision on your part and the employer's part. And as Tanya mentioned earlier, you know, there's two sides to all this. There's what's good for you and what's good for the employer. And you need to find a match. You need to find something that works out well for both of you. Uh, in order to move forward. Okay. So, Brian, the good news for nurses that are, Can are Canadian citizens is that you do have options. So speak to your recruiter and they will be able to advise you in your own personal circumstances what is the best option and the best fit for you. Um, Lucky is asking, I have my ATT now. How can I connect with the agency? Lucky, please go onto the Kinetics USA website and apply. And our team will be happy to speak to you and make sure to mention that you have your ATT or ready to, um, to take the NCLEX exam. Um, I'm just seeing what questions we have or haven't asked already. Um, okay. Um, Rain is asking, what documents do we need to prepare for the DS-260, Anshu? Um, for the DS-260, it's actually just a, it's like a 20-page form that you're completing online. Um, and so really all you need is like your passport, your birth certificate. You're really just going to be sub like inputting a lot of information on the form. So it's a lot of biographical information, information about your previous address addresses. Um, and so you're not actually submitting actual documentation with the form. You're just submitting the form itself. Okay. And Rain, if you go to the Kinetics USA website, um, or our YouTube channel or our social media, you'll find there's a course called Back, Back to Basics. In fact, I would encourage everybody to watch that. It's a, um, a, a show where we take it, we break down the, the whole consular process in three parts and take you through everything that a nurse or a healthcare worker needs to know about the green card, the consular green card process. And there's a list of documents that you need to um, collect before you apply for the DS-260. Um, or to prepare, sorry, for the, the DS260 stage. So um, there's also a download on our website and there's um, a show and a booklet for the consular green card process, adjustment of status green card process, as well as the TN process. So really important to educate yourself about this. And I don't think you can get that in, information anywhere else. And it, and it is really free because it's really directed specifically for nurses. Um, okay. Um, Let's see. Benj is asking, do you accept nurses with NCLEX with an experience gap? Uh, Benj, the answer is yes. We have employers all over the United States and some require specific experience and some don't. So we would be happy to speak to you about that. We call our recruiters career matchmakers. So they will be able to find the right fit for you. Um, okay. Um, we have a question here. Um, also from Nurse One, switching agencies before coming to the U.S. without hospital offer yet. Um, some nurses are planning to switch agency and worry about the need to pay fines. One reason is it's taking too long for the current agency to process. Um, so Nurse One, I think we already answered this question. Really, everybody needs to take their contracts very uh, offer letters very seriously. Um, and if they are committed, it's like a marriage. If you commit, you, you need to be um, committed, I think, is our best advice. Michael, Andrew, anything to add to that? No, I would agree. Okay. Um, 
Geneva is asking, I have a B2 visa. Can I do adjustment of status if I get a job offer? Mike? Well, if you're physically already in the U.S. on a B2, then there may be some options for you. If your intent is to come into the U.S. on a B2 and then hope to find a job, then oftentimes that's going to be viewed as you committed immigration fraud uh, by entering uh, on a B2, which is a visitor's visa, saying I want to be a visitor when in fact you wanted to file for uh, an employment uh, visa. You also have to keep in mind from a timing perspective, if the hospital that's hiring you doesn't have a PWD, it's going to take six months at least to get a PWD, your B2 is already going to have expired. Uh, and then if you file an extension of your B2, that restarts your intent of that you intend to only be as a visitor. So generally we do not recommend, there's a lot of employers that will not even entertain uh, filing. I think there are certain circumstances where it probably is okay, uh, but I think they're pretty rare. Yeah, I, I think we've seen the same. Um, Monica is tagging her friends, Patrick is tagging friends and colleagues. Thank you for doing that and paying it forward. Um, Anna is asking, hi, Ms. Tanya, I'd like to ask if an applicant can pay for the premium processing phase. So, um, and, and you, I believe the answer is yes, correct? Absolutely. Either the employer or the applicant act can actually pay for the premium processing. Exactly. And, um, and just for you to know, um, uh, Anna, at Kinetics USA, the employers will pay for the premium processing. Um, Okay, I see we've got some questions um, um, that we've covered already. Um, so, um, Patrick is asking, hi again, are the IELTS and the visa screen reimbursable? So, Patrick, um, because we are direct hire, it would depend on the employer. It depends on the package. And, and uh, typically what you will see in the offer letter are all the details of the offer if they are reimbursing for the IELTS and the visa screen and it will be client specific. Um, Cindy is offering, is asking, oh, so Mike, how long is an EB3 visa in today's times? So for if, if we're starting from scratch right now, how long would it typically take for the process? If you're starting with a hospital who's never filed a prevailing wage yet, then and but does do premium processing and you're not in manila 12 months it's not unreasonable if you're in manila maybe 18 months to two years um so i i would probably say if someone were asking they want a nice range i would say 12 to 18 months is probably fair i also think that every day we move forward the line it takes in Manila is going to get better. And so we're probably gonna have a more favorable answer for Manila a month from now, or even three weeks from now than we do today. Um, so that, that would be my um, estimate. So around 12 to 18 months. Yeah. And if the, if the client, the hospital has already um, uh, completed prevailing wage, you would take six months off that, correct? Yes. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. And Mike, what about a, a nurse who is not in, in from the Philippines, maybe from a, in another country? From a yeah, so if you have a, a nurse who's, say, in uh, Dubai um, and the hospital, say, already has a PWD, then you could seriously be looking at six, eight months. Okay. I don't think that would be unreasonable. There you go. Um, okay, um, Anshu, um, we have a question here um, from uh, Sarah who's asking, do you accept applicants from Iran? Can applicants from Iran do an EB3 green card? Um, I've actually never run across that. I, uh, yes, <laughs> I'm not sure. Have you, Mike? I don't, I have never run across a nurse from Iran. Yes, there's going to be uh, additional security clearances that you're going to go through, but there's no prohibition. Yeah. And I think, Sarah, you might be thinking of um, a few years ago where there was the, the pre uh, prohibition. So um, that could be the, the reason for the question. Um, Rachel is asking, can someone work in, in, the, in the U.S. as an RN 
who um as an as being HIV positive, aren't you? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we can scratch that one off the worry off the worry list, Rachel. Um, okay, there's still a lot of questions here. Um, uh, let me just see quickly what else I ha hasn't been asked. Um, oh, this is a good question. So um, Faker is asking, what are the requirements to hire an international medical technologist, Mike? So medical technologist is one of the positions that qualifies for an H1. Uh, because a bachelor's degree is necessary in all the states that have licensure requirements and all the hospitals are going to require at least a bachelor's degree anyway. So it does require, it does qualify for an H1. So depending upon the hospital that's sponsoring you, if they're a cap exempt hospital, they could go ahead and file for an H1 now. Those are hospitals that are nonprofits affiliated with universities. That's the easy definition. Uh, a, a hospital that's not a cap exempt hospital sponsoring you would likely, if we're talking today, April, early April, the lottery's already missed for this year. So they might sponsor you directly for an EB3 green card, which is on you described earlier in the uh, call uh, for in the context of a nurse aide, you have to go through an extra process. You have to go through a perm or labor certification process, which adds about six to nine months onto your process, but would still be faster and more sure than waiting until next year's lottery in March of next year. So I think that's probably the route that most employers would take. If we were having this discussion in February, they would have probably put you through the lottery, the H1 lottery in the event that you got picked. Now, from a requirements perspective, uh, you're going to uh, need um, a visa screen uh, for a med tech. Uh, you're also going to need, uh, there's certain states, I think there's maybe eight states that require yeah. a license um, that uh, you're going to have to comply with. Uh, and I think it's like AMSCP certification in most um, states, I think is what it's called. Yeah, correct. Okay, good. So there we go, Faker. And, and we have many med tech opportunities all over the United States. So please go ahead and apply and we'd be very happy to help you. Um, uh, Arlene is saying, good morning, everyone from Jamaica. I'm late today. We love that we have our regular viewers that are watching every week and no, no worries, Arlene, if you missed the questions today, please um, watch the rerun. Um, because all of your answers would be, will be, all of your questions will be answered. We are at the hour. I cannot believe it. I feel so bad because we have so many questions and I really want to try and get through as many as possible. So if I did not get your question, I'm so sorry and keep watching uh, next month. Hopefully we'll be able to get to your question. Um, I'm just going to take one last one from Happy Hipster. I love that name. Um, how can we petition? How can we petition our parents after we receive the green card, or do we need to be a citizen before we can do it? And you, um, the faster process is to actually uh, the way the process is through uh, becoming a citizen. Um, and the good news there for all of you that are uh, that once you become a citizen, you can uh, there is no like backlog. So there, you know, an immigrant visa is always available for you to be able to petition for your parents. Um, and I just went through this uh, exact situation, happy hipster. I've been, I came from South Africa. This year will be 22 years ago. Um, and I'm, you know, obviously a very proud citizen today, which is what we want for everybody who's watching. Um, and I just sponsored my mom and she got her green card. So um, this is possible. And um, as I said, that's what we want for everybody who's watching. So um, we're going to be wrapping up now. Thank you, everybody for joining us today. Thank you to Anshu and Mike for sharing your expertise. You really um, do such a great service by helping so many nurses with so many immigration questions. It's so complicated. It's so overwhelming. It's so frustrating. So we really are so grateful to you to share your time and um, to help so many nurses all over the world. Before we finish off, please uh, don't forget the upcoming shows, everybody. Um, 
On the 15th, we have stateside. We're going to be talking about what it's like to live and work in Maryland. On the 19th, we have the Lafora Talk Show, where we our topic is self-care for a nurse. Very important topic for many nurses who are feeling exhausted and burnt out. Um, on the 22nd, we have an NCLEX show. And on the 29th, we are showcasing one of Kinetics USA's um, amazing clients, Penn State. Um, a magnet system and you'll be able to learn all about that and before you leave also just a reminder about kinetics initiatives um, we have our free IELTS course we have our NCLEX scholarship don't forget the thousand dollar referral fee extended until the end of the, of May and that's for nurses with NCLEX please watch our podcast we're in the top 10 percent of podcasts worldwide our nurse aid program watch every week our show onwards and upwards and obviously as we've mentioned, we have many allied uh, needs as well for healthcare workers. Um, our winner for the, the NCLEX raffle, wait for it, drum roll, is Ezima Joy. And I'm not even going to try and pronounce the last name. So congrats, Ezima. Um, we are so excited. Kinetics will be covering the cost of your NCLEX exam. Um, and um, hopefully you will be able to pass and come through to the United States. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you, Anshu and Mike, for your expertise. Um, have a great weekend, everybody, and onwards and upwards. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.